Today's podcast is brought to you by Inverted Gear. For all your jujitsu needs, go to invertedgear.com. Save 15% off if you type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART15 with no spaces. Our next sponsor is Chimera Coffee. That's Chimera Coffee with a K. They are a coffee brand that infused their coffee with nootropics. If you don't know what nootropics are, Google it. They can do a much better job at explaining it than I can. Go to ChimeraCoffee.com, type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART for a nice little discount. Enjoy. Nick, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you coming on. You are a world traveler and you train with some of the best in the jiu-jitsu world. Welcome. Good. Thanks for having me, man. How's it going today? Good, man. Good. How about you? How's everything? Yes. Good. Where are you guys located? We are in uh, sunny New Jersey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we're in the northeast new jersey we are uh our school is in lynnhurst new jersey mm-hmm. we're like 20 minutes outside of manhattan oh that's great yeah Good so deal. we have access to uh new york city handily but we still live in new jersey where the taxes are lower mind you oh yeah right across the bridge right that's right how is uh how's california what is the atmosphere in 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 california right now because the world is going on to me that's the biggest event period to me yeah <laughs> n- no two, no two ways about it um i trained last night and uh it was really fucking cool man well you know go back starting two weeks before worlds or even sometimes a month we start getting visitors in and then this last week we must we we have on our on our big mat i would say we must have had 60 people last night in class wow. i mean it was it was the most crowded i've ever seen it so we got a lot of visitors in town for worlds but what was really cool was uh hoffa and he never does this but hoffa was just sitting there watching the classes i mean he is so Hoppa Mendez, he is so <laughs> like laser focused for, for worlds. And I think to sit there and watch like all of his students train, I think that's become a, a major motivation for him. Mm. So when you say he's never done this before, does that mean normally he's he's coaching and taking part in the roles? As opposed to yeah, just sitting yeah, yeah, he's either coaching that he and Gee switch off classes. So either he's coaching or uh or he's at home you know, resting. So for the past like two, three weeks, he's been, uh, cause I I do Nogi with him too, twice a week. And, um, that's, that's really my favorite class with him because in the Nogi classes, we get like 10 only eight to 10 people. And so I get to roll with Hoffa nearly every time he teaches, but he hasn't been teaching Nogi for the past, I'd say month just so he could, he could, uh, get ready for worlds. And so usually, you know, back to my point, he's usually at home and resting but this time for the first time ever he was sitting you know listening to music uh, on headphones and uh yeah and just watching his students train and and like i said that's never happened how does that feel with the atmosphere of the class is everybody like do they feel that energy of their professor one of the best just sitting there laser focused does that motivate everybody else you know, I, I don't know because I noticed it, you know, I, I try and notice everything everywhere I go being a writer, you know, like what's going on, you know, and so, and, and I'm so close with Hoffa that, uh, I don't know if it's just me just, you know, projecting that and seeing that or, or if other people did too, mm-hmm. you know, when there's that many people and you're training, that's the great thing about jujitsu and surfing is that, you know, while you're doing it, it, it commands every everything that you are so i don't know if everybody's sitting there thinking wow hop is watching me you know yeah interesting how is his training going like how is the world's training camp differ from regular training what Uh, changes you know, there we train with Atos more, and it just the the intensity of the roles and the length of the roles uh, it goes up. So there we have a uh, at ten thirty to twelve uh, all weekdays we uh, we have comp class, and so in comp class. Um, you know, sometimes it'll there'll be a little bit of technique. Usually, it's just sparring, but it might be five minutes six minutes, but the intensity of it just goes up. And oftentimes Hoffa will, will do like round robins where he'll, where he'll sit in the middle and guys will just roll through him in the last few weeks preparing. Mm, nice. Is there a lot of specific training? Like, okay, you start in turtle position, bottom, and I'm on top, and the objective is to get the back, your objective is to escape, rounds of that? S- sometimes. I mean, we don't do, we do that uh, in comp class like sometimes, and I don't do comp class a lot. I might do, I might average comp class like once a week or once every 
every two weeks. Um, but, uh, but because I haven't been doing it, I've watched it, but I haven't been doing it since they've been preparing for worlds just because I want, you know, I don't want to be in there getting in the way. I feel like, Hey, that's the most elite guys who are getting ready for this tournament. You know, as I, as we roll in after this tournament, uh, start getting ready for master worlds, I'll start doing comp two or three days a week. Oh yeah. So you're doing the master worlds then, huh? Yeah, nice. I sure am. Awesome, man. And you're a purple belt, right? Yep. Nice, man. And uh, you, what what tournament did you win before? Did you win the the Masters? I won I won Pans. I won Worlds. I won Nogi Worlds. Hot damn. I, I won damn. like any, NABJJF World uh, Nationals, something like that. I don't know. There were quite a few. Good for you, man. Congrats, man. That's that's awesome. That was the only way I got my purple belt. I had to win Worlds, <laughs> Nogi Worlds, Worlds, and Pans, and uh, and that was the only way I got promoted. Finally, they were like, I guess we got to promote them. How did you get hooked <laughs> up with them? Is it just your passion for jiu-jitsu and finding No, them? no. I didn't even start rolling until they opened the academy. And so I was um, I was in the middle of writing the book, Into the Cage, mm. um, uh, Rise of USC Nation. And so while I was writing that, I was like, okay, man, I, I really should – if I'm writing about this subject MMA, I really should at least learn some, you know, at least try and train some of it. And I, I grew up wrestling from like eight years old to 18. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And, and so I, you know, the first time that I saw jujitsu, I was, um, but I think it was 1999, 1998. And it was Dana and I, underneath what is now uh the ufc headquarters but there was a gym there then and there's still a gym there now but huh. uh he was training with uh and he wasn't they didn't own the ufc at that point either wow. and he was tr he was training with john lewis and so um so i was in there just getting a workout and he's like come on let's roll and so we rolled a little bit and at that time it was like i just didn't it, i didn't get the bug and so um until uh until, you know, 10 years later. But at that time I was like, man, I just got out of wrestling like 10 years ago. I don't know if I want to go back into wrestling. But, uh, but once I started writing the book, um, about four years, I think it was four, four and a half years ago, I decided I wanted to start training. And so at first Dana hooked me up with, uh, Fred mm -hmm. um, who's three time world champion. And he would train fighters, or he would train employees of the UFC downstate downstairs. And so Dana's like, just go check it out with him. And I, so I started a few classes with him. He just basically showed me how to put on a gi, how to tie my belt. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then when I came back to California, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Pat Tenori, who owns Ruka uh -huh. and, um, Okay. That's good. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. So, so, so what happened is, you know, I, I trained a little bit with Fretz and Pai Shao. And then when I, uh, when I came back to California, because I don't live in Vegas, mm -hmm. I live, I live in Newport. And so, uh, when I came back, I was talking to Pat Tenore. He said, uh, you know, I told him I wanted to, I wanted to start rolling at a gym and he's like, no, don't join any other gym <laughs> I, I, because I'm, a, I'm about to open a gym with the Mendez brothers. I didn't know who the Mendez brothers were. Uh -huh. And so I would go by the, he showed me where it was and I would go by there because it was supposed to open in a month and that month turned into the next month and the next month. And I just started getting so antsy. And so I trained, then I trained a few times while I was waiting with Eddie Bravo. So I'd go up to LA and train with him. I'm friends with Eddie. Okay. And, uh, and then they finally opened the Academy and, uh, I've been there since day one, man. And I'm really close with the brothers and it's, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing Academy. That's great that, I mean, that you fell into uh, what turned out to be one of the best Academies in the world, right? No two ways it. And I think it's one of the reasons that I've, I've, uh, obviously not just because of my friendship with them, but just because I've realized, wow, this is a, this is like Michael Jordan opening, you know, a basketball academy around the, and if I was into basketball, mm -hmm. of course, I, I would, tr I would go and, uh, join his gym. But, uh, but yeah, so to learn from, you know, these Michael Jordans of jujitsu, I just, I just, I, I really was able, I'm stoked because I really was able to appreciate the opportunity that it was. Mm. And no, no better like expression of jujitsu, of the art of jujitsu than, than those two guys. Cause they're kind of, they're, th for a long time, they were kind of opposites. And I mean, Hoffa was a, was a guard player and Guy was the guard passer. And they both were just so solid in their games and very, tactical and strategic so no no better and and not to mention small guy jiu-jitsu you know the best jiu-jitsu is to learn from the small guy jiu-jitsu 
And uh, no better teachers than to fall into those guys' laps. That's perfect, man. Yeah, and and, and the, the thing is, I weigh one hundred and sixty. I'm like five pounds, ten pounds at the most ever at any point from Hoffa, you know. And so mm-hmm. it it really is. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I agree with that thing that you should learn from small guys. I really think you need to learn jujitsu from, from uh, someone who is your size because they don't teach at all half guard mm-hmm. at all. And if you right. watch the black belt finals, when you're looking at, you know, the semifinals, the, any, any match that's like 200 and above, it's all half man, guard. there's a, yeah, there's a lot of half guard going down. And so, you know, I'm, I got lucky because I'm at their exact same weight. Um, and I'm super flexible. I do a lot of yoga. And so that game, that inverted game, all of that just played right into what I, you know, what I could do. Okay. But, but there are some guys at the gym, man, we had, uh, Jimmy Friedrich was, uh, he's competed at Metamorphs. He competed at ADCC and he was a bigger guy. He would roll at our, he rolled at our school, but he's like 220 pounds and he, struggled to find guys to roll with, especially when the Academy first opened. So he ended up going, moving down to San Diego and training at Atos. Mm-hmm. Now at Atos, they have just a lot of bigger guys. Interesting. How yeah. does, how does training, like how, how do you, how does the school run things as far as visitors when, when uh, the heads of the Academy are training for a big tournament, such as the world's, if, if visitors come in is Hoffa or Guy when he was competing, were they training with these visitors or were they cautious as to not train with the visitors? No, they definitely would train with visitors. I mean, not, not even a question, not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily, Hey, if you come visit the Academy, you get to roll with one of the professors, but if they're rolling and they decide they're going to do it, I saw them, you know, I, I would see them rolling with, with visitors, I would say a couple times a week. So, mm. you know, especially depending on the belt level, if someone's coming in as a blue belt, you know, maybe, maybe not, you yeah. know, but if it's somebody, a black belt that's similar to, to have a size, it's a good idea for him to roll with them in preparation for a tournament where they're not his regular training partners. Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, if, if it's, it's, I think they're very cognizant of the fact that people are coming to the academy to have an experience. And part of the, the, uh, the best part of that experience, the most you could hope for is the opportunity to roll with one of the brothers. Mm -hmm. And so they're, you know, they do, they do cater to that sometimes, you know, when they're, if they're rolling in that class, sometimes if they're not preparing for worlds or maybe even if they are, they're not necessarily rolling at the, uh, at the, um, at one of the other classes at comp class, if someone's at that level, they'll roll with them. But, um, during the other classes, cause sometimes they'll roll, you know, the brothers will roll a couple times a day. How often do you see the brothers off in the corner pondering and concocting <laughs> savage setups? And like, do you get to see that often? Oh, you know, I, I don't necessarily know what they're working through in their head, but they're very, but during class, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're senseis. And so they're sitting there watching everything because they need to know like where we are, what we need help on, what, you know what I mean? If they see something, someone or some, someone, like there have been times where I was doing something wrong in the middle of a, a, let's say a move, a transition, and they'll just stop the class here, circle up everybody and they'll go over it. Or let's say someone else is making that same mistake or or a different mistake. They'll address that. They won't necessarily just come up to you, which they will. But if they think it's something, wait a minute, this is something the whole class is having a problem with. Yeah, there's a common theme. Yeah, but as far as them, you know, like concocting like new, you know, this for the warm guard, I've seen or, you know, a counter to this or how do we better that? I've seen them do that, you know, fairly often, but not all the time. Interesting. Now, one of our first, actually our first experience with the Mendez brothers, um, we've been fans of theirs for a long time. And when they first opened up their academy, they had a training camp, like a four day training camp. Um, and we made a point to go there and we and we went, traveled um, and we took part in this training camp. It was four days, a session in the morning, session at night, four days straight. And um, it was amazing to be a part of their classes and uh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised we didn't see you there. Cause if you joined immediately when they open, that would have been cool. How how soon was it? How early was it? I think within the first six months of them opening, they 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 had their first training camp. It was like yeah, a I, open to public training camp. Even then, I was I was traveling a lot. Okay, so, you know what I mean. We were doing the blogs, and I was finishing writing the book, and so there was a lot of uh, there there was a lot of weekends or weeks that I was gone. Sure. 
Well, it was amazing to see their teaching style and to really see, you know, somebody who's, or both of them, as good as they are competitors, are they good teachers? And we got to see a glimpse of high-level jiu-jitsu athletes as well as high-level jiu-jitsu instructors. And that's a breath of fresh air to see, to know that you could focus so much of your life for competing, but also be a very good instructor. Because a lot of times people take those one of those two pathways, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and the, and their approach to instruction is so different than and because I tr- you know traveling a lot, I've been to a lot of academies, and uh, a lot of times it's just the typical okay, circle up. Here's a new here's a submission, et cetera. And you're just like I don't know when I'm going to fit that in my game if I'm ever going to. But they have developed a real curriculum around the Delahiba where that's one of the first things that you learn. They consider it the best guard in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And so even it, when I started, there was no beginner class. Now there's like a three month beginner class where you don't, you only spar with beginner beginners and, uh, huh. Um, and, and it's cool because that, you know, going over there and watching how that curriculum first starts, the, one of the first things they're learning is, uh, is Del Hiba. Interesting. So they're, they're just jumping, they're teaching the students right into what they truly believe. That's right. They're not starting with closed guard. They're not starting with, no, they're starting with Dela Hiva because once you get the foundation of that, everything branches off of that. And they have a curriculum, I, I, you know, that, that they have it planned out for the next six months for every single class that gets taught in the academy. Gotcha. And how do the roles differ for the beginners? Are, are they doing uh, free roles or are they maybe even starting in a De La Hiva position? Well, they'll, they'll do specific training and they'll also do free roles, but it's not, you know, when someone first comes in, it's not like the first day you're sparring with anyone. They don't, they don't do that. Um, it's like they worked them into it. You know, if you think about it, when you like when I came into jujitsu, it was very different because I had 10 years of grappling experience. Right. And so, you know, I, 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 it was OK for me to spar. I don't look back at that and say, wow, that was shitty. But I, I do see a lot of guys that start. And this is how most people start is the first day you walk in the academy. You know, you're sparring usually with like brown belts and purple belts and and some jackass that wants to show off which is typically (laughs) what it is oh let me show you this collar choke and this and (laughs) i you know you have to wonder how much um how how many people drop out because of that yeah because it's like man this is not this isn't cool you know i want (laughs) to learn it but i don't want to get beat up on every time i go Mm. so so uh, that's a good that's a that's a very interesting point to make like if you're running a school Somebody's coming to your school, even if they're a fan of like whoever's teaching, if they're a beginner, they're coming in for a purpose and that's to learn self-defense, not to come in. So their first class, couple classes, they're assuming they're going to learn the steps to, to get good at that, not to learn one step and then jump right into the pool. You know, so yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, it's so important that 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 people don't sp- that you hold off as, as much as they're excited to spar, hold off on a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two before you let them spar or, or just pick and choose who's ready and who's not ready. Don't let them jump in immediately. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. One thing that I noticed when, when we went over there, I, I didn't have the honor of, of rolling with either uh, brother, but um, I, I got a glimpse of when Hoffa really started to change his, his uh, focus from, from the guard to the guard passing and, and that dynamic style of passing and he was rolling with a purple belt there and it was just like the most amazing sequence of passing I, I had really honestly ever seen um, in person. And he just kept countering the guy and countering the guy. And I felt like for, for about 30 seconds, Hoffa didn't really make much contact, but the guy was just, he just couldn't find him almost. He, he wasn't able to establish grips and he kept getting cut off. And then at, at, like on a dime, Hava just dropped down and submitted him. It was like really amazing to see. And I felt like after that, I really started seeing him or we all started seeing him shift to a passing focus in competition. How has that changed the training environment in the school? 
Well, it, it's cool. When he did go through that transition, he started teaching it to us like immediately. Uh, and uh, I still, it's so, you know, a lot of people think of it as, okay, he's a pressure passer. And then they look at someone like Hoffman, they're like, oh, he's a speed passer, but he's not using speed. And I, I have sat him down and made him explain to me and show <laughs> me like, what exactly is he doing? And I've even, I've even filmed it and slowed it down. And it's, mm. I think it's a lot more like fencing where mm. there's just so much, he's carrying he's not moving fast yeah. so to call it speed passing is 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 not correct mm. and so he's really parrying as someone grows up and they grab for a grip he's parrying their hand he's parrying their hand parry 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 and then like you said then he drops down mm. and he's wait he's mm. creating that mm. that uh, that action where someone is moving it's almost like judo where you push so the guy will pull or you pull so the guy will push and then you got your throw yeah it's beautiful you know? so he's doing yeah. wing chun <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you no, know, he really is. And if you watch it, it's much more martial arts than it is like, oh, speed passing. Speed passing implies that he's beating you with his speed, but that's not what it is at all. He's mm. changing. It's more about velocity and changing his velocity. It's like a, a boxer, you know, so or, or like he's breaking his rhythm. Yes, and he's breaking that rhythm at the same it, time. And it's very, very, very difficult to do. Mm. I, I've, I've tried to learn it, and uh, it's, it's, it's so hard for me not to go into the, 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 what feels like the safety of that pressure passing mm. for me. Mm -hmm. you know? And maybe that's just because I'm a wrestler, but I don't, uh, I don't know, man. It's very difficult. And it's something I'm still working on today. And uh, You know, maybe in a few years I'll be like 10% as good as him. So uh, he's <laughs> pairing he's pairing with his hands, he's pairing yes. with his feet, and mm -hmm. he's placing him he's just maneuvering himself and he's, in these and he's, angulations. Yes, and he's pairing with his shins a, mm. a lot. I would say his hands and his shins. So he's constantly like almost windshield wipering, blocking windshield wipering, and then stepping, you know, pop, pop, pop. And what's what's amazing and what's so difficult about it is it's like playing the piano where, okay, you under, you start learning how to play with your left hand, and then you start learning how to play with your right hand. Mm. And then you have to, you can get them to play the same thing at the same time, but can you get them to play two different songs? or two different melodies mm -hmm. at, you know on the piano and it's it's really is something that's it's very difficult and it's hard to get for me to get my brain to make <laughs> that click i mean i dude i've been sitting there i've stopped in the middle of like when he's watching me spar i've just told my partner stop and i'm like okay what the hell are you doing this and he's like no you have to sit you have to crouch more you have to bend your bring your knees and bow your bow your knees more mm. so you can block with the shins block with the shins you know yeah it's, i've been i've been studying his style for a while we have access to uh you know their website and mm -hmm. all their roles and all their their drills i feel like i get way more benefit from watching uh said hafa or Guy's roles with the students because you really get to see their games open up and i've been studying his passing ever since i got my brown belt about a year and a half ago was that marcus mm -hmm. probably two years ago two years ago um i really set the goal to to get back to like trying to pass with looseness like i did when i was first starting out as a white belt blue belt didn't really know much i was just relying on attributes but then i kind of started getting inspired by by hafa mendez's passing and i'm like wow i can pass without doing the traditional like knee cut heavy passing gracie style and it really inspired me and i and i watch his videos almost every day with the students and one thing that i've gotten out of it what he's trying to do is misdirection it's yes. just here's one thing touch it and i'm going the other way and then when i go the other way you think that's my plan but it, it's just a constant misdirection and eventually um the pass comes with ease essentially um but i i noticed there's a lot of little schemes that he does and I, and i feel like i've i've found a couple of them maybe like two out of the hundred that he does, you know, but yeah. I feel like there's a lot of little schemes that he's developing based on the opponent's reaction. And then they all get glued together. So now it might look like to the naked eye that it's all random and, you know, off the cuff, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure it's all little schemes, right? Did he, has he given you any like little tips like, Hey, do this, then this, then this, then this. Yeah, I mean, we work on chaining some of it together, and and especially, you know, I always go back to nogi. I like it's actually you can use the same type of passing in nogi, yeah. um, and I think he was using it, uh, uh, it when we were in Chechnya. 
but uh, w- where I first saw him, because he doesn't compete really a lot in Nogi, and he did there. And um, and so in Nogi, it's actually, I think it's the best place to first start learning it because people can't grab your grips. Yeah. You know, all they can grab is your ankles. And so that gives you that that opportunity to at least start trying to use some of it. Mm. But yeah, we, we've gone through, he's gone through some of the chains and how this could work with this. But the reality is, is if you are... If you're, if he's using misdirection and you're trying to employ those tactics, it all is, de- it's like very much like surfing. It's all dependent on the wave. And so, mm-hmm. you know, am I going to come up and, and am I going to try and bust an air right there? Or am I going to ha- just give a hack or am I going to pull a floater? Well, it <laughs> depends on the wave. I can't even, how can you even think about chaining something when you don't know what you're reacting mm, to? Right. Especially if the guy does nothing. What if he does exactly. nothing? <laughs> yeah. No two ways about it. Yeah. So... So yeah. so interesting. Now, what role does does Guy play in? Since he's not competing, does he play in this training camp that's surrounding Hoffa's win at the Worlds? I'm willing to well, bet he's a mastermind behind the scenes, concocting strategic uh, plans and all that stuff. Oh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. And uh, you know, he is definitely still the main, you know, one of Hoffa's main training partners. But uh, he's he's he, he lo- Guy loves to coach, and um. It's. I could see that that's why he he stepped away from competing because he has this just passion for mm. you know winning through his students, who watching his students improve, mm. watching them win, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, he was the one that really you know in coaching me that really helped me against. Uh, this is this is interesting. So when I, I play a very Baron Bola and Delhiba is my game. Mm-hmm. I love nice. going in inverted. I play a very well, top as old game, and but when I would compete in tournaments i had a very difficult time because guys were playing you know at, at an upper age in the master's division they were playing on their knees oh, and i never right. i never i never i never see that right i don't know i've never been in a school where we start on our knees i've never been you know we start standing and so uh so it was very difficult and so he kind of strategized this with, with before worlds and uh so he really strategized with me and t- it, it were the easiest matches of my life Dope. Four, mm. yeah four four matches where i had the back in you know i would say 30 seconds to a minute so what was one thing if you can give an example that he recommended to you that he prescribed to you against someone who started passing on the knees being very, a de La Hiva player very simply just run, just go right to spider guard so so in my game i'm i don't you know, I tell you that I use De La Hiva, but I really am, am an open guard player. And what that means is I'm going to play everything from De La Hiva to spider to, you know, worm guard. To, I use a lot of lapels. Mm. And but one of the problems is when a guy's on their knees, very little of that works except for like lasso and spider. And so yeah. he's like, listen, just get your get set up your spider and lasso threaten the sweep. They're going to bring up a knee as soon as they r- remove that knee. Just throw your lasso hook out and go to De La Hiva and immediately go to Barambola. So mm. I, I play a very deep De La Hiva game and I, so I'm immediately under somebody mm. and that uh, was, you know, Barambola to the back. Oh, damn. That's awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to remember this as we talk so I can <laughs> add it. We never get to see any roles between the brothers, right? Hoff and Guy. I always feel like it's like the scene in Rocky, what was it, three? I like at the end. Going. Yeah, where where uh, Rocky and um shit, Apollo Creed fight in the dark room and they spar, but you don't get to see it. it like the the scene cuts. Do they only spar when no one's around in a dark room? Oh no. <laughs> they spar they spar. I've seen them spar quite often and it usually it usually goes to a draw. You know, where they're both just, you know, think they both know what each other is going to do and knowing what the other is going to do. They have this ability to just counter. So this just count. It's oh, it's it's awesome to watch, but there's there's not much that happens. You know, it's crazy to say that there's somebody out there that can put Hoffa Mendes to a draw. Yeah, <laughs> that's fucking it's crazy. Cr- I know. Right. It really is. So, uh, you know, I, one of the saddest moments of my life was when Guy said he wasn't competing anymore. Oh. <laughs> Does he yeah. have any any maybe super matches on the horizon years from now? Like, is it are we calling it quits forever? I, 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 I can't speak for him, but, mm-hmm. you know, he's so competitive. But at the same time. 
I will say that he is so – all of his energies right now are channeled into becoming, you know, I would think the greatest coach ever, just like he wanted to become one of the best competitors ever. So mm-hmm. everything he's doing right now – and he spars with all his students, but we've, we've now got a crop of juveniles in there that are just phenomenal and some of them that are just taking it to uh, to some of our brown and black belts, uh. even – yeah, blue belts that are. We got one. We got one kid in there, Jonathan, and he's competing. He's competing at Worlds this weekend, and I think the kid has has. Uh, he's like one seventy. I think he fights middleweight, and he has. Um, he's double gold at every tournament he's been in, and he's competing at Worlds this week, and then he's going to compete at the Royal. Do you guys know what the Royal is? No. Okay, so next weekend, not this weekend, but the next week, the weekend after Worlds at Studio 540, they're putting, Joel Tudor is putting on a tournament. Oh, I remember seeing about that. Yeah. Yeah. Called the Royal. And so he's doing it in conjunction with Bear from, uh, from Shoyer Roll. Yeah. And, uh, and so they've got a 16 person invitation invitational of blue and purple belts competing against each other Oof. but they're they're all like juveniles so it's to determine you know who is the best and it, i i think it's great because yeah. as jujitsu fans it gives us an opportunity to to learn who are the guys that when we go to the tournament next year who are going to be the best blue belts who mm-hmm. are going to be the best purple belts who are going to be you know who are the next meows keenan cornelius etc mm-hmm. etc it's like college football for the nfl essentially absolutely absolutely so this is the first year they're doing it and so we've got a one of our juveniles that's going to be in there is this kid jonathan and this kid i rolled he's from brazil i rolled with him the first time i rolled with him uh I immediately went over to Guy and I was like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> because he was he was literally one of the best jujitsu players I've ever rolled against. Wow. Ever. And, and, a, and a juvenile and I, is under sixteen. He's seventeen. 17. So and under eighteen. Got it. And uh, and and so what's cool is, man, is I've been able to see him, like visiting black belts come in and get smoked. I'm not saying beaten. I'm saying smoked by a 17 year old Holy blue belt. Holy crap, man! Ugh. Their eyes go wide and they're like, maybe I should crit jujitsu. You know, <laughs> totally. yeah, it's kind of not fair. <laughs> um, we had the Rotolo brothers on a few weeks ago, and um, when we went to that training camp a couple of years back, we met them there, and they're incredible kids, and their jujitsu was was awesome back then yeah i can't imagine how they how they are now yeah they're they're awesome those are my midgets i call them my midgets uh, <laughs> i i love them i surf with them and their dad and uh-huh. it, they're they're great they're actually in costa rica right now surfing so it's it's wow. cool to see because they're very balanced you know they do jujitsu as their life and they're homeschooled but they do a lot of surfing and fishing mm, wow so and they're the future and i love how how gay constantly talks about the future of of our generation that's why he loves teaching the kids they you know we need to teach them because they're going to be the ones teaching people and passing on jujitsu like it, it's it always puts a smile on my face when i hear uh high level guys talk about teaching kids you know yeah for sure and they're and that's you know the juve they're the kids and the kids the kids team is un believable and then we've got our juveniles and then we've got our adult comp uh, comp team but the it's the juveniles right now who are the ones that we you look at and you're like these guys are going to be competing at black belt in just 3 years some oh, of them wow. and so the kids you don't really know i mean you could say you see this across all athletics you see kids who are amazing athletes as children and then they go through puberty and they lose it some of them lose it some of them keep it you know so i don't put too much stock or I don't know how much pressure or stock you can really put in the kids. I think the Rotolos are going to be absolutely amazing. Mm. But what's more fascinating for me at this time are the juveniles. Yeah. So interesting. Mm. Monsters. Let's steer back to um world's training, right? Mm-hmm. How how do how are you guys drilling? Is there numbers? Is there time? Is it one single move and then the next on the next set we do we we add another technique and then on the third set we add a third technique. Um, how, can you explain a little bit? Yeah, we, we, you know, the, the, at the academy, I would say that 80 to 90% of what we learn is transitions. We've spent very, it's, it's a stark contrast to other gyms in the sense that, you know, if we're learning something, it's going into that curriculum, it's going into that sequence. So most of the time, what we're learning are transitions to positions. Um, and so if we're, let's say we're passing the Delahiba, 
then we'll go through like last night. We'll, we went through like three different aspects of passing the Delahiva, you know, knee slice, uh, leg weave, uh, you know, there mm-hmm. or in the lake and then leg drag. And so those are the three things we went over last night. And so usually it's, it's, it's like that. It's like, okay, you're in a certain position. What are your options? Because the reality is, you know, I, when I, when I wrote my book, I interviewed uh, Greg Jackson and we talked at length about John Jones's training. And what Greg went, what I was really curious about is Greg employs something called game theory. And so what he's looking at is he's not looking at, okay, throw an uppercut here and do this here. He's looking at guiding John. His strategy is to get John to where he, what he calls like a hub with many nodes off of it. And so he wants to get to a place where John doesn't just have if he gets a guy against the cage where he has three or four different options, because the reality is you may go to, to a, but it's not going to, but that may not, when that doesn't work, you go to B and yeah. B may be the perfect setup for C, mm-hmm. but they're all related to that specific position. Yeah. Right. And that's something we learn in jujitsu as we get like further down, further up the ranks where you start to realize, man, I can't just do one move at a time. It, 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 normally, uh, move A doesn't work. Normally, it's move B or C that works, um, especially when you're going against somebody that is at your skill level. So that's very interesting that he said that. And so it's kind of like what we were talking about Hafa's passing, right? He's he's kind of redirecting you and placing his body in a position where he has a few different options, and you only have that one or two options, but he knows of it. And yeah, and and that's that's where I think Hafa's uh, you know Hafa's you know years lifetime of of training jujitsu benefits him in although for him this like velocity passing whatever you want to call it misdirection passing is somewhat new. It's still the fact is is that he is able to use all of his knowledge to learn it so much quicker than someone like me. Mm. And so I'm he knows when he's standing over the top of someone and they're trying to play guard, he knows okay, based on the where their hip is right now, he's got three options or two options. That's all he could do so it's very easy for him to parry it before it even while it's happening. Yeah. Whereas for me, I'm sitting there going, "Oh, fuck, man." You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of okay, in this position I can do A or B. Where I'm not, where I should be really thinking is, okay, he's going to do A or B, and I'm going to do this to counter it, and that's where that slowdown. Like I'm for guard, I never get lost playing guard. I play guard, you know, extensively. I feel completely comfortable playing guard, mm. but and, I, and so I don't get to a place where I'm like, gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what someone over the top of me is going to do. I could see it. I've been playing it long enough. I've only tried to really learn the velocity passing mm. that Hoppe does. I'd say for the past maybe eight months, 10 months. And, uh, and I get lost all the time. I reach places where, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what I should do, Yeah, you know? And then, so like I was saying earlier, that's why I'll, where I'll regress back to, if I just freaking pressure right here, I'm strong. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be able to at least stop what he's doing and maybe slide my, the problem with that kind of a, that kind of passing is that when you do it in a tournament, by the time you get to your second, third or fourth or fifth match, you're spent. Yeah, mm-hmm. so true. You know, right. and so like playing guard, I don't really get tired of playing guard. You know, it's so much technique for me, but passing, man, it's mm-hmm. a. It's now, a, wouldn't you say if you spent most of your time passing as opposed to, as opposed to guard playing, you would have the energy to do that? But if you fell into the guard you, by third match, you wouldn't have the energy to do that. Right? No, no, I, I, I'm saying for me, I don't. Okay, I don't get tired of playing guard. But I get exhausted trying to play top, <laughs> yeah. you know, top, top game. Just it just exhausts me because I always regress at some point to the pressure passing. You know what I mean? Which sure. is mm-hmm. I find to be much more uh, grueling on the body. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Grips, everything, you know, with guard, I can sit there and use my feet on your hips. My just to keep that distance where I'm not using so much muscle. Gotcha. Right. How are you? Are you guys drilling for numbers or time? Oh, uh, we drill. No, we drill for time. Okay. So it'll be like, okay, and we don't, it's not, it's not something that we're even cognizant of. Like they've got a timer on the mat with, on the iPad. And so they're like, okay, do it until this or do it until, you know, mm-hmm. it's really something that we're, when you're in the class, you're not even aware of, you know, it's like, okay, just switch back and forth or you go for this long and then we'll start to round over and they go. But I, I don't, you know, we don't see the clock, so we don't know how long it's even going to be. Gotcha. Do the top guys ever have a bad day? Do they ever come in and then they're just not themselves every now and then? Like, is that 
Does that happen often? I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I know it, it happens to me. I mean, I, I always say it like this, is that jujitsu is really about the hammer and the nail. And any day that I know, that any day that I'm the hammer mm -hmm. and I feel great about myself, I always temper it with the fact that I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'm the nail. And that's, so, you know, I always know if I have a great day, tomorrow I'm going to fucking get smashed, you know? Sure, and then yeah. if I get smashed, I don't get too down about it because <laughs> I know tomorrow I'm going to have a great, I'm going to have great roles. So gotcha. it's always nice to have two great days in, in a, a row. row. <laughs> it's I really think, nice. I don't think it's, I've never had it. So I wouldn't even say that that's possible for me. <laughs> I've had it one time. It was glorious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just feel like that, what you just said there, hopefully it helps a lot of people because people go into the gym and they, they have a bad day. Just things aren't connecting right. They may not have even got beat. It's just their mind wasn't clear. They weren't connecting things right and they get discouraged. And then the next time they come in, it's two bad days in a row. And then it, yeah. it, 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 it amalgamates. But we have to realize, like, like you said, you know, it's okay to have a bad day. But what's the good thing about a bad day is being enthusiastic about the good day, which could be for the very next day. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, this goes to illustrate something that I don't, I'm not a fan of MMA. You know, I watch MMA. I think it's cool. I like some of the fights, but I'm really a fan of, uh, of jujitsu. I love jujitsu. If I never watch MMA again, I'd be fine. Wow. Um, even, even though I've written a book about it, but to me, the, there's two sides of, of MMA and there's, there's one side, which is the martial arts and then the other side, which is the meatheadedness. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, the meatheaded macho thing is, is just purely in my mind is about insecurity. Whereas I regard martial arts as being something that's more about, it's less about, I beat you, I'm going to beat your ass. I'm the toughest guy in the world. It, to me, martial arts is more about the internal journey, uh, internal journey. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I tell some, I was telling a guy in the, in the class a few years ago at the school, I was like, listen, man, you can either like Mike Tyson or you can like Bruce Lee, you know, you could either mm. model, one can be your model or the other one. Mike Tyson was one of the greatest heavyweights ever. And, but that macho-ness ended up landing him in prison. I don't want to be Mike Tyson and I love Mike Tyson. I'm mm. a fan of his, but I would rather be like Bruce Lee. I would rather be someone who's more about that internal journey of bettering myself. And that's, right. that to me is what jujitsu is about, you know? Mm. So, so I say that in regard to having a good day and a bad day, yes. you know, the, the, having those bad days all the time are what present, first of all, off, they humble us and you know what I mean? And which yeah. is as, as far as your journey in martial arts is probably the foremost, most important thing. Absolutely. Humbling yourself. Yep. Absolutely. That's the beauty of jujitsu because we can spar all the time without yeah. like running the risk of too much injury. So you have a lot more opportunity to be humbled. And I feel like usually in, in a straight jujitsu class, those students, there's a lot more humbleness than in MMA classes or boxing classes or kickboxing classes and so on and so forth. Yeah, you never – and think about the interviews. You know, you never see someone in jujitsu – uh, before, you know, like one of the top guys, Hoffa Cabrini, no matter who it is, Leandro Lowe, no one's sitting there going, I'm going to beat his ass. I'm going to, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. and then, and then you watch it in, in MMA and I'm like, it's entertaining, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's so, I understand why someone like Rafael Dos Anjos, who comes from jujitsu is like, no, my fighting is going to do the talking. I don't yeah. care if it's going to sell more tickets. I'm mm -hmm. not going to do it. I, I, I respect that. Hell yeah, man. Me Big too. Time. Like Demetrius johnson um yeah he's just like listen man yeah like this is not about what this is not what martial arts is all about um that's a beautiful thing and and we're happy to be a part of jujitsu and it humbles us that way how do you think hoffa is going to do in the worlds i i know your answer he's going to win but how do you <laughs> think he's going to compete in the world do you project him landing certain things i mean I, you know i think he's gonna last year he uh Last year, he just was so dominant and do all submissions until he got to Cobrinha. And I'm a huge Cobrinha fan. Mm -hmm. I think Cobrinha is amazing because given how late he started jujitsu and how old he is now and to be at that level where, you know, he's smoking everybody in the tournaments also. Yeah. Um, I, but, you know, he's getting older and Hoffa's at that prime physical age. You know, mm -hmm. I think Hoffa's going to. He's going to roll through. I, at least I hope he does, you know. Mm. Um, but uh, 
No. I don't know. Uh, it's it's interesting because Gianni Grippo has now dropped down to light feather. You've got uh, quite a few guys that are dropping down rather than face Hoffa at, yeah. uh, at feather. Hoffa or Cabrinha. You mm. know, they're, the two of them are just so dominant. I don't know if you'd have a Hoffa, you know, would, how good would Hoffa be if there wasn't a Cabrinha, you mm. know? Right. So interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and now that division is, I feel like it's been, it's bigger than it ever was right now, right? Mm-hmm. There's like 26 guys. I feel like it's never that big. Um, it's it's yeah. yeah but you know i just on my podcast modus v we i just went through a breakdown of all the brackets with bear from shoy roll we <laughs> nice. just went through yeah and, and when you look at it there may be more there may be more numbers but it doesn't seem like you know Stacked. there's anybody yeah it's not like i I was looking at it going okay yeah this is gonna be he's gonna have a tougher one this year i don't think he's going to at all he's hmm. only got four fights they're gonna be tough fights but at the same time, you know, can we expect even, to see a lot of passing or a lot of guard playing? I don't know. I mean, that's I have no idea. I would imagine that he's going to do both. I mean, hot. he really likes to show show off the art, but it also is going to depend on mm. what he sees. Mm. You know, I don't think I don't think he's going to go into it and think, you know, I, I have to pull guard or I have to if I get in this position or that position. I don't think he's thinking like that. You Do, know, does it's he what, ever what plan happens. for a specific opponent? Like, all right, I know if I go against uh, Cobrinha, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull guard first, or I'm gonna pass first, or does he know? Does he plan for specific opponents? I would have to think that he does. Okay. It's not a discussion. It's not a conversation that I've had. But when you're when you're fighting, you know, high profile guys that you fought many, many times in the past, and there's video out there, I would have to think that. You know, you're aware, like, hey, this is what I have to look out for. This is what, you know. Sure. Just to put yourself in a better position because you want to worry about, number one, myself. But it can help you win if you do focus a little bit on what the other opponent's strengths are, right? Yeah, absolutely. Deep. But at the, but at the same time, so, you know, it's like I, I love the meows and what they said years ago where it's like I they one of them I, I can't tell them apart. One of them <laughs> doesn't have a tooth like me. But uh, he was saying we don't think about our opponents. You know, all we think the, our opponents are just a canvas against which we are going to show our art. Hmm. So, I mean, at the, you know what I mean? Or Keenan with Keenan Hoppe, they, they've talked extensively about Moosh in mind and clearing all thoughts and just going out there and doing what you're going to do. So, you know, yes, you're probably going to be aware of what your opponent's going to do, but you don't really want to fixate on that. Yeah. You really want to, you really want to just, if you trained enough, you drilled enough to where, you, you know, you get into the tournament and you're just like, I'm just going to show my shit. Like when I, ha- I had it, when I won all three tournaments, I think it was two years ago, I had drilled so fucking much going into mm-hmm. that year that, play, you know, all I did was play guard. And I was just like, my mindset was, I'm just going to play guard. And I know nobody in this tournament is going to pass my guard, mm-hmm. whether I win or lose. I don't know. But I know no one's going to pass my guard. And that actually just took all the pressure off me because I was like, I don't have to win. I don't have to lose. I just have to go out there and play guard, Yeah, you know, yep. and no one's going to pass my guard is what I was telling myself. And no one passed my guard. So and, and winning or losing will be a byproduct. Of yes, it is a game. byproduct. I think it's uh, when you look at um, uh, I'm going to plug my podcast one more time. Because please, I just, please do. I yes. just yeah, it's Modus V with Nick the Tooth on uh, iTunes. But I just had on uh, Casey Jennings, who's a pro volleyball player, and he's married to, to Carrie Walsh. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ball, she's like a, going for her fourth Olympic title and they or Olympic gold in uh, in Brazil this year in volleyball. So they're beach volleyball players, and the, he said we don't ever think about winning or losing ever. We go out nice. there and our goal is to have fun because whoever's having the most fun is going to win. Yeah, yep. that's so true, man. Exactly. I know when I first started competing back in the white belt, blue belt days, that's all Marcos would tell me. Marcos is my my professor. He always used to say, just go in, have fun. Just go in, try to pull off some cool moves. Just play your game. And that's kind of where, where, where that took me uh, as far as competing. And I never had that pressure to win. And I felt like that's why I always did – pretty good for for what i've done I, I didn't win everything but i didn't lose everything but i know i always uh pulled off some shit you know what i'm saying and i think it's because Uh-oh. that made me worry about myself and and it took the edge off yeah i remember my first couple tournaments man that i lost uh like in the first round i think it was my first three or four tournaments um you know, I went out there just really starting jujitsu and it was just more of a holding match. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. and it, like where there were, and then I said to myself, you know what? 
forget this. If I ever compete again, which I did, I was like, I just, my only goal is to, to show really good jujitsu to actually do jujitsu in a match instead of just gripping and holding. And it's not fun. uh, It's boring. No, that's what I felt like. I was like, what am I doing? This isn't jujitsu. Let it flow. And if you went, Hey man, if you jump like a flying triangle and you lose it and you get past, who cares? You jumped it, man. You went for something. And so, uh, once I, once I adopted that mindset where I was like, listen, I like the meow said, I just want to show my art. Mm, exactly. Yeah. I feel like uh, I'm in that stage in training now. I'm not competing as much, but in training, I'm always just trying to think, how, how can I make this fun today? How can I make it less boring than yesterday and, and pull off my techniques? I, I don't care. Like uh, the last thing I want is to be stuck on top of uh, anybody and they're just trying to hold me down in their half guard and they're wrapping me up and like I rather just tap out and and keep going and and make it more interesting. And I feel like that's when that's when you can sustain being good and sustain improving and evolving. How does Yeah, I mean Yeah. I I, w- I was going to say, you know, when I first really started and I had to go for an entire year I made myself only play guard because coming from wrestling, you know, I was doing like I said in the tournaments I was doing so much wrestling. It was just re- uh. it was it was stupid. It was stupid and pathetic. And I so bet what you I were did was exhausted. Yeah, it was just dumb. And then so what I said was this BJ Penn told me, he said, listen, man, if you can get a good guard, he said, no one will ever beat you in a tournament. He goes, that's how I won my world title. Mm. And and so I said, OK, you know what, BJ, I'm going to do that. And so for an entire year, all I did was play guard. And I would say the first eight months, I didn't even try and sweep or submit from guard. All I did was try and retain my guard. And at first, like, you know, young girls would pass my guard. <laughs> but after a while, you know, you continue to just play it and play it. And it, your mind opens up and you're like, oh, all these possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. uh Hiron Gracie said that about what Helio told him, Grandmaster Helio Gracie. He said when he, I forget when, but he 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 said the story where um, Helio told him just defend. I don't want you trying to sweep. I don't want you trying to submit. I just want you to get your guard passed and defend. That's it. And he said he made him do it for like a year or something. And at first, he I think he was like a teenager, young kid. At first, it was, he was just like, why? Well, I don't get it. Why am I doing this? When can I attack? When can I attack? He's like, just keep doing it. And eventually, he just started not getting past. And not getting past turned into naturally sweeping people without even trying because of his confidence and his defense. And like that that's the benefit of a, of, of having a confident guard, right? Like yeah. stopping yeah, and the I pass first. For me, and it, maybe it's a liability for me sometimes when I roll, but I like to play like a count, like a counter punch guard where, you know, like Anderson Silva is really waiting mm. for someone to make a mistake and yeah. then to pounce, you know, to frustrate them, frustrate them, let them make a mistake. Boom. You yeah, know, okay. attack. And you feel that works for you very well. Oh yeah, I do. But I think it's sometimes I need to get more aggressive where I just come out. Some guys have a very aggressive guard where, you know, they're, th- and, and obviously that philosophy is, you know, a great offense is the best defense. And sure. so if, when you're attacking, attacking, some guys have that style. I'm too lazy for that. Mm. So, you know. <laughs> cool, man. Um, one last thing. I know, I know we're running out of time, but, and this might be off subject, off topic. It's just kind of a question we ask everybody. Nick, where do you find inspiration from? Whether it's for jujitsu, writing, anything, where do you find inspiration from? You know, I I think it's all about life is all about for me, um, fun, it, really pursuing my passions. And so, if I'm passionate about something, then I really don't need to find inspiration. I love jujitsu, and so it's something that the more I do it, the more I love it. It's an addiction. I couldn't even begin to tell you how to find a passion for something that you don't feel. Mm. You know, I mean, there have been times I used to play competitive racquetball, and then I played competitive squash, and I I really pursued those things until I lost my passion for them. And so I, it's it's my guiding like ethos 
for me, I'm always thinking, you know, I'm always doing what I love to do. And if there's something I don't want to do, I fucking don't do it. Mm. <laughs> you know, if I stop wanting to do jujitsu one day, then I'm going to stop, you know? Sure. And there have been, there have been times with, uh, with surfing where, you know, for the past two years, two, three years, I really wasn't surfing. You know, I was probably only surfing like once every two weeks because I was so passionate about jujitsu. Well, recently I've been, I've gotten really back into surfing and, you know, I, I don't know, man, follow your passions. And if you don't have a passion for something, then step away from it, you know, and I, and maybe that's what happened with Guy where, you know, com competition, he just became more passionate about, uh, about, about teaching and helping others. Mm. So inspiration comes from love and passion of what yeah. you're doing. Dang. Yeah. And if I don't have it, if I'm burned out, I mean, I, I don't, I don't make myself do something because that's how you get injured. Sure. You know, you start, you push yourself, Oh, I got to do this. And you have this thing in your head. It's like, no, 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 man. Just follow that passion and you won't have to worry about inspiration. Mm. Thanks, man. Mm. Thank you so much. I know you got to go. Um, do you want to give any shout outs, plug your podcast one more time and yeah. <laughs> oh, please it's, do so. Yeah. Modus V at, uh, on iTunes, you can look up Nick to tooth or that. And I, you know, I don't, I, 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 it's it's a podcast where at first I had a few MMA fighters and I don't do that anymore. It's all about jujitsu and nice. mental preparation and physical health and diet. So nice, man. That's awesome. And I got, I got to check out. I listened to one or two of your podcast episodes. I just don't have much time to listen to podcasts, but I definitely want to check out the last one with uh, Tenori. Right? That's how you say it. No, name? no, no, no. The last one I did was with Bear. So Bear Quinta from. Uh, uh, show your role. Show your role. Show your role. Yeah. And so all we're doing for that one is we're just talking about here's who to look for in the lightweight. Here's who to look for in oh. featherweight. Here's who to look for. This is what you can expect in the brackets. That's so dope, man. I got to listen to that today. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. really jiu -jitsu, it's for jujitsu geeks. Yeah. So I think you guys would like it for mm -hmm. sure, man. Mm -hmm. And we got to do this again, man. I'd really like to get into more about your life and and where your journey started and where it ended or where it's gone to thus far. You're you're such a interesting person and um you know thanks for coming on hold on have no, you I, I, have you tapped ahead. out dana white <laughs> <laughs> we don't roll ah. so he, he doesn't he doesn't train jujitsu so remember when I, dana was training to fight tito oh, oh and he had that no. triple jab he was <laughs> awesome was, yeah that was the stupidest thing ever <laughs> 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 i always tell people man don't fucking mistake uh, stupidity for courage so mm. <laughs> cool. yeah. and on that note man thank you so much um good luck to your team at the worlds and uh we look forward to talking to you soon Take i appreciate on. it thanks guys thanks Bye. man peace